Now, I'm just going to take a little bit of a, a slight risk at this point. I don't normally do this very much, but I felt God gave me a couple of sort of prophetic things in the worship. And um, Josh, I feel God wants to speak to you. <laughs> and uh, I just, Josh, I just, you've been such a blessing. You guys have been such a blessing to us. You've only been with us a short time, but already it's just wonderful to see the hand of God on you. And uh, I just want to affirm you in that. But also I felt during the worship, I just felt this sense in which God is pouring fire into your heart and that there is going to be a, a growing fire in you uh, over this, this next for however long. And it's for your benefit, but it's also a fire that he's going to pour out to others through you. And I just believe that God's hand is on you in a wonderful way as a couple. And I believe that there is this thing. I could just see fire pouring into you and coming out through you in kind of streams of fire, as it were. And God's hand is on your life. And it's a precious thing. So I just wanted to honor you both and uh, to share that. And the other thing that particularly struck me actually was to do with you, Sandra. Uh, this message that we got recently where you felt something, God saying something about healing. And I just felt that God wanted to encourage you that he's sown a seed in your heart. I think sometimes when we get a word like that, we think, okay, great, well, let's see it in operation. But the ways of God are, are rarely immediate in that sense. I just feel God would say he's placed a seed in your heart and to keep nurturing and watering and prayerfully looking to him for it to begin to manifest, but not to be in any way discouraged by delay. Delay is part of how these things work. God sows a seed and we, we prayerfully look to him to bring it through. So I just believe God would say it's in your heart. He's placed it in your heart and let's prayerfully look to him as it comes through. Okay, those are the key things. Um, now, we've been going through Matthew for months and months, uh, which has been a joy. And over the summer Sundays, we wanted to just take a bit of a, a, a step back from that and have a bit of a different focus. And so over this next five Sundays, starting today, each of us on the eldership team, the five of us, will be taking a Sunday and broadly speaking, looking at the kind of theme of prayer, which we kind of have felt God has been highlighting to us in recent days. But uh, it's not just going to be five sermons on prayer necessarily. Um, and, uh, but I trust that you will find it helpful for your prayer life. And um, I, uh, when I preached on prayer a little while ago, I took us up to the beginning of the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6 and didn't really go much further into it because, well, there's an awful lot to unpack and it would have taken a long time and we kind of just moved past it a little bit. But I alluded to the possibility of coming back to it. I'm conscious a number of us have been going through the prayer course and that's very helpful as well in, in similar ways. But what I wanted to particularly focus on today is this principle that in prayer, God gives us some huge advantages. And there are tools and ways and approaches and skills, if you could put it that way, that as we acquire them, help us to become all the more effective in prayer. I think that we've probably recognized in recent weeks, prayer is important. Yeah, we've, we've heard a number of messages which have been themed around prayer. We've all been thinking, yeah, okay, prayer is a good thing. But uh, I, I won't ask for a show of hands, but my guess is that probably most of us have known what it is to try to pray and find it extremely difficult. Yeah? A few nods of uh, have, uh, agreement there. It's not easy. Sometimes praying with someone else makes a huge difference. It can really help you. But sometimes even praying with others can be difficult. You know, I was praying with Dave and Bob this morning. It's hard work. Yeah, it's tough. But, um, and I'm, I'm half joking. Yeah? Because I find I can sit and pray even with godly friends and still find it a battle. Still find... Because, you know, prayer is conflict. You are engaging in something of a, a warfare when we pray. We have an enemy who hates to see us praying. And he'll try to stop us praying. And so you will, I mean, just yesterday, I kneel down at the bed, I'm just about to start praying, and just sinful thoughts start going through my mind. Things I wasn't even interested, wasn't even considering, wasn't even, you know, and, I, and it's like sinful thoughts start to go through my mind, sinful imaginations, lustful things. And you think, and I think, isn't that interesting? I've just settled down to pray. I wasn't even thinking about that kind of stuff. Suddenly it's all coming to my mind. I think, I wonder why that is. The enemy will do anything he can to try and stop you praying discouragements, distractions, just whatever it is. 
And so it's, it's not an easy thing to do to become prayerful. It's hard. And there are things that we can learn which really help us. And I've had the great privilege of living under the roof of a praying, a, a praying father and a praying mother for many years. And uh, today we'll be going and visiting them, be with them for a few days. And whenever I go down and stay with them, we're always struck by dad's steadfastness in prayer and mum, that they will be praying. I mean, you can guarantee it. There's no question. In the next few days, while we'll be under their roof, they will pray for hours while we're there, without question. I'd be utterly baffled and shocked if that's not the case. It's always the case. They just pray. They just do. And dad has helped. I've seen dad do things that have really helped me in how to pray. And so I alluded to it in a video, one of the little videos we did. First thing was just simply starting with thanks. Thanking God. Dad will thank God for ages. Just thank God. And just thank God for anything and everything. You know, whether it's, oh, thank you for the weather today. Thank you, I'm not in physical pain today. Thank you, uh, you know, the, for electricity, for run, running water. Thank you. And, you know, it can be menial, basic things. Thank you for the evidence of your kindness to me yesterday, the way that you blessed me, the, uh, the prayers that you answered. Lots of thanksgiving, thanksgiving, thanksgiving. And of course, more and more coming to thanking him for who he is and the gift of his son and our salvation and the cross and him dying in our place and all that he is for us in Jesus. And so it says in Psalm 100, enter his gates with thanksgiving. And there's a sense in which thanking, we thank our way into the awareness of who he is. And it says enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. So he will start with a lot of thanking and a lot of praising. This is what you are who you are. Now, the danger is you get down to pray, and what you'll start to think about is how sinful you are. And so sometimes people say, well, start with confessing. Start by saying, oh, Lord, I'm sorry. Oh, and then think of all the things you need to say sorry for. Now, my dad has often said, the enemy at that point will give you a shovel. And you think, oh, yeah, and that. Oh, yeah, and that. Oh, yeah. And before, and before you know it, you're so preoccupied with how bad you are, that if you're lucky, if you emerge from that hole by the end of your prayer time, that's about as successful as it gets. It's like, well, I'm back to where I started. That was an exercise in futility. And it's like we, by all means, if you know you've just done something really bad and you need to say sorry, say sorry. But as a general mode in prayer, the Lord's Prayer doesn't start with forgive us our sins. It starts with our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. A God would focus so it's a helpful principle that as we pray, we come to him and we say, thank you for who you are. I start with a focus on who you are. Now, one needs not to be overly ritualistic or rigid about these things. I've been reading this fabulous book, A Praying Life, which I left over there, unfortunately, um, which is a great book. And he says in it, uh, you must uh, use, you know, pray, you're coming to Father, and how does a child talk to their father? You know, when my children talk to me, they don't begin with adoration. You know? They don't necessarily start with thanksgiving and praise. You know, they just come and say, Daddy, I need. Uh, Daddy, please this. Daddy, please that. And so we mustn't be too rigid, but we must beware the danger of a self-preoccupation. Okay? So we come to Father. He's my Father. Now, I will tend to begin by saying, Father, and look to him. And then just speak with honesty about the things that are kind of coming through my heart, the things that I'm conscious of. But I will want not to be too long before I start to really move into thanking and praising him. Okay? So that will help you in prayer. Start to look to him and acknowledge who he is. Engage with him and start to do exactly what we've done this morning in worship, which is to begin to recognize he is the basis of my hope. He is my salvation. He is. It's him. And looking at his faithfulness and recognizing, wow, that's what you are like. See, if you look inwardly, you just go down the tubes. I've said to you before, my dad said to me once, he said, if I thought about you as much as you think about you, I'd be as miserable as you are. Yeah, that was a helpful thing to say to me at a time when I was extremely self-preoccupied. And the devil knows my weaknesses, he knows yours, and he knows if he can get my focus inward and looking at, oh, do you even really believe? I mean, oh, do I even believe? Oh, and I start to fall apart. And Caroline's watching me, rolling her eyes like, oh, not this again. And, you know, she has to kind of say, uh, hello, you know, to say, wake up. 
you're a Christian who loves Jesus. Let's kind of get on with that, shall we, instead of this. And he loves to bend our view in on ourselves. So we need to lift our gaze and look to him. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. May your name be honored and lifted up, seen for what it is. Now, what I will then do is I will tend to move into looking at the names of God, which is something I personally find helpful. And I'll just go through various names of God. So for the rest of this morning, I just want to look at the first one that I normally look at when I start to pray. I just thank God. I say, thank you. You are. And I tend to pray, you know, help me to enjoy you as this. Help me to enjoy you and glorify you and delight in you and drink you in and see you as this and recognize you as this and bathe in the fact that this is who you are. Live in the good of the fact that you are a name in Hebrew, Jehovah Sidkenu. Now, if you're writing it down, it's an unusual spelling. It's T-S-I. So Jehovah Sidkenu, T-S-I-D-K-E-N-U, Sidkenu. And it means the Lord, our righteousness. And he is your righteousness. Now, that alone, if you just dwell on that reality, that doesn't half strengthen you. Because you think, he is my righteousness. My righteousness, if I look at my performance, how good I am, feeble, useless nonsense. Yeah? That's not just my assessment of it, that's God's assessment of it. <laughs> okay, it says in Isaiah, it says, our righteous deeds are as filthy rags. Actually, used sanitary towels is the Hebrew. Yeah, the Hebrew talks about used sanitary towels. Not a pleasant thing, yeah? So saying, my righteousness, that's what I've got to offer. My best deeds rooted in my own flesh. What I can produce alone without God's involvement, that's the best I can offer. Not very impressive, yeah? It's filthy rags, disgusting. So if I say, God, I tried really hard this week. Can I come in on the basis of that? It's not impressive. I have the provision of the fact he is my righteousness. I have a perfect, spotless, flawless righteousness, which is his gift to me. And as I come to him, he's recognizing this righteousness is a, is a supply. I, I am given righteousness by him. It's a gift, a free gift. Now, if I want to come to him, I need righteousness to come before God. That's why Jesus is the provision of my righteousness. He is the way to the Father. And as I said from that Spurgeon quote earlier on, the qualification for coming to Jesus is not producing a righteousness of my own. The qualification for coming to Jesus is that you're a sinner. Any sinners present? Yeah? If you, if you recognize, I sin, then you qualify to come to Jesus because he's a friend of sinners. He's a forgiver of sin. So we come and we receive his clothing of righteousness which enables us to stand before the father now let me just say a couple of things before we kind of look and open up this name a little bit knowing the name of god is what makes a huge difference okay so listen to what it says here in psalm 9 verse 10 one of my favorite verses it says those who know your name will trust in you for you've never forsaken those who seek you now here's Here's one of the challenges and one of the kind of uh, pitfalls we can slip into if we're not careful. We can think, I've got to trust God. Okay, trust, 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 right, trust. I'm going to trust him. Yes, I'm going to really trust. Am I trusting? Uh, I don't know if I'm trusting very well. Oh, I'm not trusting well. If you concentrate on trusting as an active verb, as something you're trying to do, when do you ever do that? I mean, that's bizarre, yeah? I'm going to really try and trust Boris Johnson this week. I'm going to trust him. Mm! It doesn't work that way, does it? When do you trust someone? When their track record proves them trustworthy. Boris Johnson, interesting. <laughs> when it comes to God, if I'm going to decide to trust him, it's not going to be an, an issue of willpower. It says, those who know your name will trust in you, for you've never forsaken those who seek you. Those who know what you're like, they trust in you. Do we want to know if we can trust God or not? We need to look at him, what he's actually like. And when we look at the God and see what he's actually like, we see, oh my goodness, he's flawless. He's never lied. It's impossible for God to lie. He cannot lie. He is a God who cannot lie. I think that's, that's pretty good. That helps. 
If I get to know his name, if I get to behold, look at what he's like. What he, you know, his names tell us what he's like. We've got lots of different names for God in the Bible. Same God, lots of different names. And these names tell us what he is like. And those who know his name will trust in him. So it's a great thing to learn as much as we can about the names and the character of God and see who this God is that we're putting our trust in. Because the more I get to see, wow, he's like that. He's so kind. When people say sorry, he rushes to them in mercy. He's a God who sets people free. He's a God who, who, he's got total authority over Satan and death itself. He broke the power of death. He's more satisfying than anything else on offer. This God is, is totally unsurpassed, unrivaled. There's nobody like him. Who is like the Lord our God? The more we look at him, the more we think, the more I know your name, the more I trust you. Those who know his name will trust in him. For he's never forsaken those who seek him. He's a God who responds as we seek him. So that's one thing to bear in mind. That's Psalm 9, verse 10. Second thing to bear in mind, Proverbs 18, verse 10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are saved. The more we know of his name, the more security and safety we find in who he is. His, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. So knowing his name gives me a place to hide. You're my righteousness. Mine is rubbish. Yours is perfect. You are my righteousness. You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. Out of the memory verse we looked at recently. You're, you're my hiding place. You're my strong tower. I hide in you and I'm secure because no one, you try and, you try and accuse Jesus of something. Now, we've been reading through with Lucy and Samuel, looking through the Gospel of Mark recently. We're getting closer and closer to the cross. You see the Pharisees and Sadducees all trying to attack Jesus, all trying to, and it just bounces up. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. Jesus makes fools of them. He doesn't even have to try. I mean, just look at him. He's perfect. <laughs> It's just totally spotless. That's my righteousness. That's, that's what I hide in. A mighty fortress is our God. This, this provision of God. I mean, wow, he is awesome. His name is a strong tower. And then lastly, before we move to looking at the name, it says in Daniel 11.32, the people who know their God shall be strong and take action. Or it says stand firm and take action. Knowing what God is like enables us to stand. Okay, it helps us to trust him. It's a strong tower. It enables us to stand. The more we look at what he's like, the stronger we find ourselves. The more secure we find ourselves, our position to be because of who he is. The enemy will try everything he can to take your focus off of that and back onto yourself. And so we have to be quite deliberate and say, I'm going to look at what he's like. And this is what he's like. So let's just briefly look at Jehovah Sid Canu. It comes in a bit in Jeremiah. In verse, chapter 23, and I'll just read to you the verse where it's found. And he's just been saying, the shepherds, the leaders of Israel are a joke. Yeah? The guys who were in charge of Israel at this point in their history were jokers. They were useless. They are not leading anyone to Jesus. Totally selfish, totally sinful, complete idolaters, nothing helpful at all. And so there's this, this utter indictment of these terrible shepherds of Israel throughout Jeremiah 23. And then God says, I am going to give them a real shepherd. I'm going to give them a true shepherd. And you can probably guess his name. Yeah. <laughs> it says this, this is predicting Jesus, promising Jesus. It says, behold, verse five, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. So a king is going to come, and he's going to be the supply of righteousness that we need. And because of him, we'll dwell secure. We'll be at peace, because we have one who is our righteousness. Now, it says in the book of Revelation that the devil accuses the brothers and sisters day and night. So the devil's got a number of weapons in his arsenal, yeah? So he will tempt you. He will he'll try to deceive you. He may at points be able to afflict you with various different trials and all kinds of different things. But one thing, it says, there's only one thing it says he does day and night. Something he does ceaselessly is to accuse you. 
He accuses you. And you're probably familiar with that experience of being accused, of having those thoughts that go to your mind, think, I'm no good at this. Oh, it's just, you're just, you're so proud. You're so foolish. You're so this, you're so that. You're so, forget you. No one cares about you. No one listens to you. But, you know, you're just so sinful. How could you, you're probably not even a Christian. I mean, just look at you, you're a waster. All this kind of stuff that can go through your mind. Now, it says that the devil is the accuser of the brothers and sisters. He does it day and night. And here's where we get it wrong. We get the accusations of the devil coming at us saying, you're no good. And we lift up a shield of, oh, I'll try harder. We lift up a shield of, I'm doing my best. We lift up a shield of, oh, I'm better than I was before. We lift up a shield of, I had a spiritual experience a while ago. I felt good. We lift up all these different shields, and ultimately none of them can withstand the enemy's assaults, not very effectively. But God has given us provision of that which actually can prove effective, and that is the fact that we don't meet his accusation with, my righteousness, I'm trying to be righteous, I'm trying to be good. No, we meet it with the fact that Jesus is my righteousness, and no one can fault his perfect righteousness. And so the devil can throw whatever he likes at me, any accusation whatsoever. It might be quite true. Yeah, he may say something, I think, well, that's true. Yeah, it could be whatever it is, whatever accusation. I, Jesus is my righteousness. Jesus is my shield. And whatever he accuses me of, he can't accuse Jesus of because he's totally flawless. He's completely perfect. He never sinned. He fulfilled the law completely. He never once didn't do what he should have done. He never once did something he shouldn't have done. He never spoke a wrong word. He never thought a wrong thought. He never did a wrong action. He was totally flawless. His enemies couldn't find him guilty of sin. His dearest friends and clo those closest to him knew him to be absolutely perfect. Those closest to me, no, I'm not. Don't you? <laughs> so my, my daughter will attest to that. Yeah, those closest to me, they know. Yeah, no, daddy makes mistakes. Of course he does, he sins. Jesus never, ever, ever sinned. Not once. And so when the accusations come, it's recognizing I have a righteousness that's just perfect. I can hide behind that and enjoy the freedom that it provides. I have a righteousness that was done, it's given, it's performed, it's finished, it's a perfect work. And that righteousness is my protection from every enemy accusation. So it says... In Romans chapter 5, and this is where we kind of, this is the thing we need to learn more and more, that we learn that we, we don't succeed in our battle as Christians through our efforts and through our doing our best. It doesn't mean that effort is wrong, that effort is required, but we don't depend ultimately on what we can accomplish. We depend on the provision of what Jesus gives us. So it says in Romans chapter 5, in verse 17, if because of one man's trespass, one man's sin, death reigned through that one man. Now, what's he talking about there? One man's sin meant that death reigned over the human race. Who are we talking about? One man's sin plummeted, plumb, plummeted us all into, into devastation. Genesis chapter 3, yeah? One man's sin, Adam's sin, the whole human race falls under a judgment of death. So he says, but if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? So how do we win and how do you pray? We win and we pray <laughs> by recognizing that we have one who is our righteousness. You have a perfect righteousness. His name is Jesus. And it's the, it's the abundance of his grace and the free gift of his righteousness that enables me to reign, to win, to conquer, to have a measure of genuine victory. To actually learn to succeed in the battle, to learn to prevail in prayer, I, I start to move forward, not because, well, I try really hard, but because I reign in life through the abundance of his grace. I recognize he's a God who gives tremendous mercy. 
He gives and gives and gives again. He pours out love. His mercy and grace is not meted out in little kind of, here's a little bit more, here's a little bit more. No, he, is, he compares himself to a spring of living water. So when we come to praise, why it's so helpful to start with thanks and praise. We come to him and we think, oh, you, you pour out mercy. You are abundant. You are generous in giving away grace. He gives it. We reign in life. We win through the abundance of his grace. It's not, it's not limited. It's abundant. And the free gift of his righteousness. He makes you righteous as a gift. Listen to John Bunyan, uh, the writer of Pilgrim's Progress. He had this fascinating experience where he essentially kind of saw a vision. Something he might not have realized about John Bunyan. He was a vision seer. But he says this. He says, but one day, as I was passing in the field, and that too with some dashes on my conscience, feeling glum and guilty and depressed and condemned and a bit low, fearing lest all was not right, Suddenly, this sentence fell upon my soul. Thy righteousness is in heaven. Your righteousness is in heaven. And I thought, I saw with the eyes of my soul, Jesus Christ at God's right hand. There, I say, as my righteousness. So that wherever I was or whatever I was doing, God couldn't say of me, oh, he lacks my righteousness. For that was right before him. I also saw, moreover, that it was not my good frame of heart, my emotional state, that made my righteousness better, or my bad frame that made my righteousness worse, for my righteousness was Jesus Christ himself, the same yesterday, today, and forever. You understand? I came to realize, he is my righteousness. I can't add to that, neither can I detract from that. My emotional state makes no difference to it. It's a permanent, settled reality. There is a righteousness at the right hand of the Father in heaven, and it's given to me. I am on the receiving end of it. It's, it's, it's considered mine. And so when I come to God, I come righteous because I'm in Jesus. Now, you know that story of how uh, Isaac has Jacob and Esau, uh, the two twins, and uh, in his older age, I, uh, Jacob, the crook, comes to his blind father and he disguises himself as, as, as uh, Esau. He, his father's blind, so he puts on Esau's clothing and he puts on some hairy stuff because Esau's a hairy guy. And he, uh, he puts on, he gets kind of Esau's, surrounds himself in Esau's smell and Esau's clothing and he kind of tries to hide in Esau and then he comes to the, to, to the father to Isaac and asks for blessing and the father says who, who, who is this so, oh, it's Esau and the father says it sounds like Jacob but I, I, I smell the, the smell of Esau and he feels and he, yeah, okay I think it's Esau and he blesses him now there's a picture there of what it is that we come in the favored son. But the difference is God is not some blind fool in the heavens. God is the one who orchestrated this. He's the one who gave us Jesus to hide in. And he said, when you come to me, when you come in Jesus, I smell the smell of my son. And I pour out blessing on you because of Jesus. Because you're hidden in my beloved son. So we receive blessing in Jesus. Now, let me just, um, I wanted to just read you one more thing and then I'll, well, two things and then we'll come to a close. But I left, I thought I brought it up, I left it on my seat. So if you bear with me one second. This is such a helpful, wonderful thing from this book, A Praying Life, where he talks about what it is to pray in Jesus' name, okay? He says this, imagine that your prayer is a poorly dressed beggar, reeking of alcohol and body odor, stumbling towards the palace of the great king. You have become your prayer. And as you shuffle towards the barred gate, the guards stiffen, your smell has preceded you. You stammer out a message for the great king. Uh, I want to see the king. 
Your words are barely intelligible, but you whisper one final word, Jesus. I come in the name of Jesus. At the name of Jesus, as if by magic, the palace comes alive. The guards snap to attention, bowing low in front of you. Lights come on, the door flies open. You are ushered into the palace, down a long hallway, into the throne room of the great king, who comes running to you and wraps you in his arms. The name of Jesus gives my prayers royal access. They get through. Jesus isn't just the savior of my soul. He's also the savior of my prayers. Asking in Jesus' name isn't another thing I have to get right so my prayers are perfect. It is one more gift of God because my prayers are so imperfect. We get access in the beloved Son. We said before, when Jesus said, pray, he said, when you pray, go to your room, close the door, speak to your Father who's in secret, and your Father who sees what's in secret will reward you. And a few verses later, he says, your Father who is in heaven, he's in two places. <laughs> And it's remembering when I go into my room and pray, he's there in that room with me. But it's also remembering he's in heaven and I, in Jesus, am sat at his right hand. I can just talk. He's right there, available. He's available for us. Praise his name. And I'll just finish with this. C.J. Mahaney wrote a wonderful book, The Cross-Centered Life. I highly recommend it. Fantastic book. And he says this. He he. This is something that I found so helpful. I mean, I come back to it again and again and again. But we, to take advantage of the fact Jesus, he qualifies us to come. So we need to recognize when I come to prayer, I'm not to look at, do I feel good? Am I worthy? I'm not worthy and I can feel rubbish. Jesus is worthy and he's perfect. I'm gonna, I'm gonna piggyback him. I'm gonna just trust in him. I'm gonna talk to the Father based on Jesus, not based on me. And I need to tell myself this. And listen to how he puts it. He quotes Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. He says, have you realized, preacher David Martin Lloyd-Jones once observed, that most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you are listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself? That's such a helpful principle. Most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you're listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself. I agree. Let me explain what Lloyd-Jones means by listening to yourself. If you're anything like me, there's a good chance you do it every day. You know the routine. Every morning, the alarm clock erupts, demanding attention. Make it stop. Make it stop. You hit the snooze button. A precious eight minutes of floating, timeless oblivion pass. And then the grating alarm starts again. You open your eyes and the listening begins. Today is Thursday. Oh, no, you have the sales meeting. You're better off curling up here for the day. You should exercise. Oh, the back is sore. Forget it. Two feet are thrown over the side of the bed. The voice keeps talking. Yesterday, what was it? Oh, that new noise from the car. Great. Life is just one big broken, whirring mess of, and you need to balance the checkbook. As your bare feet hit the cold bathroom floor, the voice picks up its pace. What did Laura mean by that comment? Was she being sarcastic? Can't anyone in this family learn to put the toothpaste back? This weekend will be so busy. You've got so much to do today. You should pray. You don't have time to pray. You didn't yesterday. The mirror needs to be cleaned. You shouldn't have watched that show last night. Wow, I need a haircut. Soon, God feels kind of distant. I feel so drained. Can you relate? On a daily basis, we're faced with two simple choices. We can either listen to ourselves and our constantly changing feelings about our circumstances, or we can talk to ourselves about the unchanging truth of who God is and what he's accomplished for us at the cross. Is it any wonder we're so often so unhappy? We're listening to ourselves. We need to start talking to ourselves, telling ourselves he's a friend of sinners, telling ourselves he listens. The Lord will hear when I call on him speaking to ourselves of his truth. And just a final verse. It says this in Micah chapter 5, verse 4. It says, He shall stand, talking of Jesus, and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great. And the ends to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. It's who he is, it's his righteousness, it's his perfection, 
It's his glory, it's his power, his unchanging ways, all that he is. That is our security. That's why we dwell secure. Okay? So I urge you, worship him. Praise his name. Look at him. Focus on him. Celebrate him. Recognize he is given to sinners like you and me. He's a provision of righteousness. It's a gift. You don't deserve it. You can't earn it. It's a gift for free. It's just ours. We get to keep it forever. And because of that, we are welcome before him. Okay? Now we're going to break bread. We're going to, uh, we're going to finish with a, a closing song. And as we do, we'll uh, do the bread and, and juice. And uh, so I just, a, a, couple of, a handful of us are just going to serve you and bring it round to you as you stand where you are. Uh, so if I can invite Paul to come up and... Uh, if we just stand together and I'll just pray and then Paul will lead us through a song. Jesus, we look to you and Father, again we Thank you so much that this provision of righteousness is spotless. It's perfect. You are our hiding place. We hope in your word. Lord, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? It's not about whether the devil can beat me or beat us. It's about whether he can beat Jesus. And he can't. Holy Spirit, we pray, please help us to see and recognize the reality of this sufficient Savior, this conquering one, this one who gives righteousness to us for free. It's a gift. It's just ours for free. We don't want the righteousness of our own, but that which comes through faith in Christ. We pray help us to trust with all our heart, recognizing I have a perfect righteousness. Help us to rejoice in it and enjoy it. And I pray that that will help us as we pray. That we recognize, I'm not coming saying, look God, I've tried. I'm saying, look at Jesus, Father. Isn't he righteous? <laughs> and because of him, I've got access. And Father, here's my needs. And here's the thanks and the praise I want to bring to you. Lord, we pray, help us. Let these things help and establish us. For your glorious name we pray. Amen. Matt, have we got the words for um, when I survey the wondrous cross? When I survey the wondrous cross? Can you tell me how many verses that would be? <laughs> we can practice this. Can you tell? Me?
Father, we thank you so much for your amazing kindness to us. We pray, please help us, Lord, to lay hold of these truths and recognize that you've made provision for us to come to you. You've adopted us into your family. You've made us your own. And we pray, help us, Lord, to take full advantage of this and to dwell secure, recognizing our Savior is mighty. Our Savior is enough. Your blood is enough for us. Lord, I pray, please help us, lead us into prayer. Let these things that we've heard about today really equip us. Let them strengthen us. Help us to recognize Jesus is mighty. And because of his might, I can dwell securely. Because of his majesty, he's an awesome savior. So we get to rest in this wonderful grace of God, this righteousness given. I pray, let it make us strong. Help us to, help us to be skillful, as it were, Lord about recognizing, hang on a minute, I'm thinking of myself again here. I'm getting discouraged because of who I am. I need to look again and see. He's enough. He's enough. His righteousness is perfect. His righteousness is his gift to me. And I can rest in it. Lord, help us, I pray, Father, to really dwell in that reality. and Let it make us strong, I pray. Thank you, we feed on your flesh, your blood. Pray, help us to be strengthened by this grace as we go into this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you'd like to receive prayer for anything,